So uh, I'll get started. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, a lot of folks are, uh, you may wonder what's Plantronics doing here as a hardware company. And um, I'll just make some brief statements and, and then Jonathan can really get to talking about this great game. Uh, what we are really interested in and what we've been looking at is the socialization of communication and voice and the power of voice within gaming. So if you think about the PC, obviously, that's a no-brainer. Everyone understands people play online and, and chat and talk. And you've also seen that, obviously, in the console with Xbox One. And we were partners with Microsoft in making the first headset for Xbox Live. And looking at the mobile space where you know, I was at conferences like Google I.O. and just two years ago, people were saying, oh, well, people would never use voice, or how does voice make sense? Because all you want to do in the mobile game is you know, just kind of have this private little side game experience. And I think as we're starting to see, uh, there is a socialization aspect to voice. There's a power to voice. And using one's voice uh, with technology, with new software and innovations, like the game you're about to see and hear about, I really think open up a completely new dynamic uh, within the casual game space. And um, you know, with that, we're happy to uh, uh, present and support uh, the efforts of Reactive Studio and really look forward to working with other studios who are really looking to push the bounds and find ways that we can support them. Because like I said, we really believe that uh, the power of socialization uh, does come through communication and does come through voice within gaming. And with that, I hand it off to Jonathan. <coughs> Thanks. Um, hello. Uh, so I've got about 15, 20 minutes or so. I'm going to cover what I can about the topic. Uh, but there will be many aspects that I gloss over. Um, these slides also will be available, uh, and I'm happy to do follow-up discussions with anyone. Um, it's important to point out this is not a technically focused talk, uh, but my engineer and sound director are here in case you'd like to chat with them afterwards if I in case I'm not specific enough when it comes to those kind of uh, uh, details. So um, I entered the industry as a game writer uh, in the casual space working for Zynga on Indiana Jones Adventure World. Uh, this was an early story, an IP-focused uh, Facebook title, and it, gar it, it, garnered some, it launched and garnered some attention, I think it was in 2011, uh, named a top five uh, social game by Game of Sutra. Um, in addition to writing, uh, I then also spent some time as a narrative designer on another IP-focused Facebook game, um, and this time it was for Disruptor Beam. And in Game of Thrones Ascent, I worked on a, a text-based conversation system and tool set. I wrote a, a Rashomon-inspired story outline uh, for adapted and original content, uh, and then led a team of writers to implement this narrative. And uh, the reason this is relevant is this is where I kind of fell in love with the design of narrative systems and not simply just writing uh, uh, dialogue. Um, so as that drew to a close, I met my co-founders, Bruno Battarello and Matt Albrecht, uh, and together we talked about how to provide an audio-only experience of story with interactivity. Um, we looked around, and the landscape was fairly sparse. Um, you can see a, a few of the audio titles here, uh, audio game titles that I've listed here, uh, but really no one was pursuing uh, the same concept that we had planned. Um, and, and I was still fascinated by that, the, the notion of a serialized story technique, uh, as those were the ones that influenced uh, the creation of the Indiana, or original Indiana Jones movies. Um, so I had studied serial comic strips and Saturday matinees and uh, old-time radio dramas. So uh, we decided to follow that interest for an old-time radio drama style with a more of a, a present-day spy thriller story, and that's what Codename Cygnus is, an interactive radio drama. So I'm going to show you... Uh, it, it's, it's often very difficult to describe something that is audio-based but has no visual, so I'm just going to show a video of how it sort of works, the basic mechanic. Actually, I'm going to show you a better version.
Sorry about that. So, there we go. So that was a, a, a short uh, demonstration of how it works. There's there's a, a prompt that is presented, and the person responds, and it, it moves kind of like a choose your path. Uh, story. Uh, the, the experience of audio content provides options for player decisions, similar to, you know, like I said, the, the choose your path stories, uh, and, and the, the story will branch and then reconverge. Um, however, it, it works, as you saw, not only by tap input, but also with voice input using speech recognition. Um, and the player decisions affect the character stats, as you see here, for the inclusion of what we're just calling like light RPG elements. Um, so in following a serial structure that we set out to do, each episode is about 15 to 20 minutes uh, in, in a single playthrough. There's more audio content than that. Uh, and, a, and a set of episodes is a mission, as you see here. That's the menu system. So this, in a nutshell, is, is the pilot effort of an interactive radio drama. Uh, but now that you have some background about that project, uh, I think it's important to take a moment and, and point out the purpose and the goals that we adopted as a company. And first, as a business, we wanted to examine a model of free download with paid episodic content. So this is similar to the way that it, the, the Telltale uh, Walking Dead or uh, Wolf Among Us uh, episodes roll out. And we wanted to try that uh, in a mobile game with audio. Um, we also wanted to develop our own proprietary uh, storytelling system with a replicable content pipeline, something that we could reuse in the future that was ours. And finally, it was very important to us to explore the power of sound. Uh, there's been an interesting revival of podcasts and sound-only shows. Some of you may have heard of uh, Welcome to Night Vale, which has become very popular. Uh, and it harkens back to an oral tradition, uh, which existed prior to print culture. And, and this is in which an audience hears a story told rather than reads or views it. Um, we were interested in tapping into that sort of uh, like nascent emotional power uh, of the imagination. We wanted to immerse people, in the, the player, in, in a soundscape. So finally, these right here are, are the design pillars that best represented all of our ideas and goals and the purpose of the project. Uh, number one, acoustic primacy. A player must be able to play with their eyes closed. Uh, even if there are visual cues, the core experience cannot rely on them. Number two, it was a narrative foundation game. The story experience and the fictional character goals uh, should trump the mechanical experience, any win-loss conditions, or even any statistical implementation. Now, <laughs> some have pointed out this means that it may not be a game, uh, but only entertainment, uh, you know, and maybe that's true, but I'm also gonna go see Steve Gaynor's talk at GDC, which was just announced about, uh, about why uh, Gone Home is a game. I think you're gonna find that interesting. Um, so number three, dialogue focused. Uh, interpersonal conflicts and dramatic progression were proceeding and more important than any notion of spatial progression or skill-based action. Non-player characters end up serving as dramatic obstacles. Uh, and number four, as I've mentioned before, episodic structure. Uh, the structure of the experience uh, should be that of living through segments of a serialized drama as if you're the hero of the story. And then those were the, the major design pillars that we tried not to stray from. And so in keeping with the sort of self-set restriction of our design pillars, uh, a primary challenge with it was that the player's experience of story should not require sight during play at all. And so therefore, the simplicity of our UI, which you can see here, grew from that. It's basically a content menu that initiates an audio player um, and has controls. Uh, as a result, the game is actually completely accessible to the blind. So another primary challenge uh, was telling a story with audible elements only. Uh, these w right here is what I, they're what I consider to be the building blocks of acoustic storytelling, writing for the ear, sound effects, music composition, and voice performance. Now, you can also see here a page of our final script, which uh, makes use of the radio drama format uh, for easier distinction. Now, suffice it to say, <laughs> this was actually a very difficult shift to make. Uh, despite research, we ended up facing a lot of trial and error at the prototype phase, which luckily, though, prevented later issues. Uh, by making mistakes at that early stage, we kind of honed our narrative design and the process before we even implemented the technology on a phone. Uh, and the first prototype to be actually was just uh, a set of note cards that I had written on, and we asked the tester to sit there and respond uh, and listen while my wife performed the lines and flipped through the cards. Uh, and we learned a lot early. And then even later, uh, when we, we used a computer and we had sound files and speakers and we just had somebody respond and listen and I would just click the sound files to play. Um, so, a <laughs> okay. so a discussion working within these constraints, uh, you know, as we move on and, and get into like all of these very, very uh, specific uh, narrative elements, uh, it could fill an entire separate hour-long talk. And I, I actually probably will pursue that at some point. Um, but th this right here is the start of how each of these could be broken down and elaborated upon. 
Um, one could further study this sort of a breakdown by if you go, like I did, and delve into radio or audio drama resources. They're out there, they're on the net, there's a, a niche culture that, that is into sharing this, this um, I don't want to say a lost art form, but a, a, a more ador dormant art form. Um, but I should also point out uh, that, our do, that, that due to the goal that we wanted there to be immersion with uh, acoustic storytelling, uh, it became very important at that design and writing phase to consider what w these concepts. Uh, foreground, background, proximity, and transitions. Those are concepts that I'm, I'm still trying to understand a little bit better and uh, Shannon and I are now using as a sort of uh, common language uh, and that's evolving. Um, so also when making our content interactive, w we decided to divide the function of our voice performances into categories. Uh, and this became a very crucial step in the early process. Um, we identify the narrator characters who function as in-fiction prompters that describe, guide, and set the scene. And in our game, as the spy, you, the, it's the handler back at HQ who's talking in your ear, like in the James Bond movies. And that's how we created an in-fiction narrator character that presents the prompts and describes things. Similarly, there are other characters in the course of the story arc that will act as assistance characters and they sort of set the scene. And uh, for example, in our first episode, that character is kind of like the Q character, the, the one who brings the gadgets that you rendezvous with and they help to orient you toward your goals. Now, the remaining characters fall into the more traditional literary function of generating conflict or uh, creating obstacles. Now, when it comes to the actor performance of these characters though, uh, our char we, we careful voice direction made a huge difference. Um, and we are, are, are we receive a lot of uh, feedback, positive feedback about uh, how we did in that regard. And it was very tempting to simply provide lines or, or use like an online service, there are websites that do this, and uh, just have them recorded and sent back. Um, but instead, we Skyped, uh, we Skype patched into all remote actors and we held uh, recording sessions with local actors. Now, for these sessions, oh goodness, this is crazy, we looked into studio space rentals and retail sound booths and unfortunately these costs are actually dictated by the music industry and by bands going in to record albums and it was just incredibly expensive and we didn't realize it was going to be that way until we'd already committed. Uh, we couldn't afford it. And so we're like, screw it, we'll, we'll make a sound booth ourselves. And so we built a sound booth in my house and what you're seeing right here is sort of a, 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 a slow progression of the building of the house or the uh, sound booth in my house. Um, so we made it in three days for about $700. Um, and we, if we were to do it again, we could probably even do it with a little less expensive and still have the same quality, I think. We, you know, it, there's a little bit of a learning curve with that, of course. Uh, but it paid for itself in about a week of recording sessions. Um, and, and that sort of resourcefulness, I think, enabled us to do something that was highly polished uh, and yet was not insanely expensive. Um, despite an uh, otherwise simple scope, you know, in, in keeping things as simple as possible every step along the way, our decision to use speech recognition for voice input. That was what the, probably the most complicated and difficult to, to implement uh, aspect of our game. Uh, but it, we felt it was very important and we've also received feedback that, that it is a, a defining feature uh, and that it has, was worth it to struggle. So most speech rec recognition options, uh, they don't work offline. They, they make a call to the API to, make, uh, to, to do a, a hypothesis. And so if a casual audience wants to play, they want to play anytime, anywhere. So uh, not, have, not working when it's not connected to the internet isn't really an option. Um, also, the current options for licensing are not really indie or even mobile game friendly at this point. Uh, they're a little bit more of a, a, an applied technology, uh, at, at, as I see it. And speech recognition, those licensing options usually charge per API call, even if it's a, a minor amount or even per word. So this is kind of like agreeing to a revenue, a very tiny revenue share before you even start out, before you even build the game. Uh, and it was kind of bad for our, our goal of the, a free model that you can download and play and we would be doing calls all the time for people that had never paid for any content. So we decided to go against that sort of a universal uh, uh, option. But there are open source options um, and ultimately we went with this. But typically they require native implementation to suit unique softwares and hardware. So for example, we have to build it into o iOS with uh, with Objective C, and we have to build it into Android with JavaScript. So, um, alongside this engineering process, uh, we also needed to constantly reevaluate our, our, our uh, presentational prompts and how, even in the design, the narrator would present things to the, the uh, player. Um, 
in order to sort of provide that intuitive experience, we, we found it better to limit vocabulary at an early stage because it makes it easier for speech recognition to be accurate. Um, and we decided if we isolated and focused and honed down, we could then learn uh, you know, what works and what doesn't and, and kind of wrangle with that technology and then add more complex words uh, and, and, uh, in, in future titles or even in future episodes. So it, this is similar when it comes to things like a single word versus a whole uh, phrase of, or a whole sentence or a phrase. It's much simpler and it works easier if it's a single word. And so our design kind of focused in on that. And as you can see, these relate to the stats. And so as you say a word, uh, it became economical that you know, someone who speaks that word, they know that they're choosing to be that, uh, be that stat. Okay. Um, a final note is that it, you know, using speech recognition can be somewhat location restrictive. Uh, it's just not really possible to use it in public areas. Like for example, when we're demoing at uh, uh, conferences and things like that, we have to say, okay, you can go and check out the speech recognition later, but in this huge uh, conference with all the background talk, we have to shut off the speech recognition and they have to tap because uh, that introduces errors and introduces uh, contamination into the, the, the recognition. So that's something that's a problem to solve. Okay, so <laughs> Likewise, just like any process, there were many other like technical setbacks that uh, proved much more difficult than we originally intended. Uh, so regarding content, our uh, sound files were just huge at first. Our first 15 minute episode was uh, 500 megabytes. <laughs> uh, so that's not gonna work on a phone. <laughs> uh, especially if, you know, considering that we ended up with two and a half hours uh, and around one and a half hours for a single playthrough of content for mission one, uh, it just wasn't feasible. Uh, so we had to find a sweet spot between compression and retaining audio quality, and that was really uh, uh, something that, that the sound designer uh, uh, worked on very tirelessly and, and made very good decisions, and I had to trust her, and she did a great job with it, and we're hearing good uh, feedback about that, even though our uh, mission sizes are about 30 to 35 megabytes each now. So now, we also, as a result, needed a way to manage file downloads in packets, uh, and, and that, uh, became a, b a bit of a hassle and something that we had to work out uh, in terms of the, the, the CTO. Uh, now, here's something interesting too. Now, regarding fluidity of audio, and this is what I call it, uh, in a branching narrative, the ear can easily detect cuts and jumps. You don't quite think about it until it's, it's there and you realize that, that that seam is very, very annoying if all you have is audio. Um, and we got tons of feedback earlier on. We were just kind of patching you know, files one up after the other uh, back to back. And every time you hit a seam, it was, it was annoying. Um, so we had to fix these sort of visible seams with multiple overlapping tracks, and that became very complicated, and it required a lot of careful planning at all stages of the pipeline, even at the design level, at the node uh, and branching node uh, 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 phase of the pipeline. So finally, um, quality audio is also not really compatible with Bluetooth while using speech recognition. Uh, this is kind of a, a major industry problem at the, at the moment, and I'm not sure you know, we're not sure where, what's gonna happen in the future, but uh, it works fine with one-way use in output to like speakers or headsets. But once the hands-free, what's, what's termed the hands-free profile is used for bi-directional input, meaning it, uh, sending, sp receiving speech for recognition as well as playing sound files, uh, the quality becomes very low uh, in the audio that you hear. Now, it, it, so it's, it'd be kind of like if I were to play the sound files through Skype to you right, through the, the, the Skype mic, uh, because that's using bi-directional. Now, um, this, again, is like an industry issue, and currently there aren't any available solutions, but I think we're gonna start seeing more and more of that as, as people at attack that and realize that, that voice is important. So now moving on uh, from the challenges that we faced, uh, I'd like to present three major discoveries that we had along the way. And first off, the episodic formula did work. Um, although our total reach, it's not really breaking any records, uh, and we had no marketing budget, we did achieve higher than industry average conversion from someone downloading free and converting to paid. And it, it, at first this was really exciting and interesting, and people were like, well, how, how's that happening? And then we thought about it, it's a lot more like, you know, you read the first chapter of the book, you know, an e-book, and you're like, yeah, well, if you like it, you're gonna buy the book, and if not, then you're not. Um, and we happen to have a story that a lot of people wanna uh, listen to. So that worked out good. Um, here's another thing. Our engagement, we found, is, is fairly high on like D1, uh, like, you know, the term D1 to D7. But during that first week, uh, we, we see a trail because our format of sort of the bite-sized pieces of 15 minutes at a time, it encouraged prolonged use. 
And um, we're, we're looking into why and trying to understand this, but we get the sense that someone uh, picks a certain time in the day and they enjoy a new episode each day for a little while. Um, and we want to, again, you know, do interviews and find out more about that. So we found that some people cannot actually conjure a mental map simply from audio. Uh, it's not everyone, uh, it, it, it's a portion, uh, but although you know, many people can perceive uh, a proximity based on sound, like they can hear that this character was set over here in, three, in a 3D uh, 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 soundscape and, and this character is over there, or this person is that far away and I can hear uh, the glass clinking in the background behind me. Uh, and, and for example, uh, blind people can set that and create that mental map, you know, no problem. But uh, there are others who need, absolutely need visual context or else they're a little confused. Um, so we're searching for solutions to this and uh, we are planning to add some helpful visual features, sort of like a, a top-down blueprint map uh, and that image would provide that simple context that is opt-in but it doesn't at the same time get in the way of our, our, our design colors. So we're keeping those but we just realized that for some people it's a deal breaker and we don't want to lose those people. So most importantly, uh, when innovating in this direction, we realize that audience education is a huge issue, especially if you're trying to, to, to do something new like this. Um, although our basic onboarding works, and it's a very smooth process, it's fairly intuitive, we weren't quite prepared for everything. Um, for example, some people, they'll use the two-way Bluetooth uh, and think that the sound quality is innately low, and so we're having to use you know, support measures and uh, frequently asked questions to, so that they know why that is. Also, um, as designed, a player, if they wanted to, could start playing the game uh, plug in a headset, and they just put the device in their pocket. And if they're using uh, earbuds with a microphone, they don't have to do anything else. They don't have to have it out and be looking at the screen, but we're very, we're very primed towards that. If I'm going to play a game, I'm going to take out my phone, and I'm going to look at it and touch it. But uh, our game doesn't have that, so it kind of goes against the grain, and so we're trying to understand uh, and trying to uh, come up with solutions on how to communicate that in our app to the people how it can be played. Um, so yeah, because a lot of people just have no idea that's it's that simple to use. Um, we also want them to listen with quality peripherals because like I said, there's this 3D soundscape that we've created, but it's lost when it's just the device speakers, which are mono. So um, a lot of people, I, we think, are not even experiencing the quality. Um, and so after we launched, we uh, put up an interstitial that provides the suggestion prior to the first play. And so here are some interesting stats, right? At the start of episode one, 28% listen at a low volume, 35 at medium, and 37 at high. And then by the end of episode three, which is the first episode that you have to pay to complete, by that point, it is 11% are listening on low, 39% are listening on medium, and 50% are listening on high. So thinking about this, is this because those who continue to play recognize that there's a valuable sound there and they tune in, or is there a drop off? Is it because those who listen at a low volume uh, with only the mono device speakers are just like, eh, not for me. So um, we plan to, you know, uh, to reach out to our audience and perform interviews and figure this out. Um, and in the meantime, this is also why we're partnering with Plantronics. Uh, we feel it's, it's really important to clearly message that there's a better listening experience out there to be had in our game. So to conclude, uh, we found that there's definitely a, a significant interest in interactive acoustic storytelling. And, and given that the fan base that we've developed we believe there's something to our approach that's unique as a form of expression and as a meaningful way of entertaining a listening audience's uh, imagination with narrative. So and that's it. We're going to start a Q&A. What I find interesting, you were referring to storytelling as a classic way for immersion, but Actually, with the gameplay, you break immersion in the storytelling. So how did you find out to get the right moments where, without breaking immersion too much in storytelling? Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. We, we, we did a lot to, to test that. What it comes down to is it's, it's kind of like when you go to see a play, right? And you, there are conventions that you sort of accept. You're like, okay, you know, there's going to be footlights, and that's going to represent sun, and this is going to... And, and it's kind of like that. It's like we start off... In, in our tutorial, we make it very clear. It's like, this is how this works, and you, know, you, you can either go along with it or not. Some people may feel that immersion broken. Some people say that. And I feel like our biggest of breaking of immersion, which we'd like to fix, is on the single prompt ones, because we showed dual prompts here. Not, they're not all dual prompts. Some of them were just like, turn the page. But we have them say, continue. 
and that feels even even if even if the the physical care or the other character is saying if you heard that say continue it just it doesn't the, the turn the page thing doesn't quite work so we're we're trying to fix that but it's what it comes down to is it's kind of a design principle and it's a notion of creating um, uh, conventions that you stick to from that on out and that allows people to just like let it go and and they can you know people's uh, uh, minds will go there and and retain it themselves as long as you're not violating those conventions you set. I've got a lot of questions. So awesome. <laughs> I, I, I pick, first of all, the one, um, why, wh uh, why did you choose to build your own booth and not use one of the services? Did you test them out and w were not, uh, recording services, sorry. Um, were you not satisfied with the quality or? Of, of quality of what? Of the recording services, like um, the online you mentioned. I mean. Well, uh, you know, we, we still may test that, but um, for us, it's it's the fact that it's it's it has to be fluid, and it has to sound like two people are in the same room talking to each other. And I do a lot of voice coaching to make that happen. It's like if, if someone is emphasizing the word "run, run," and then you know the response is, "Huh, what?" You know, it's like it, there'll okay, be that yeah. disconnect. And so you know, maybe it's a little bit because we wanted the control of it too. Um, but uh, and, and I've heard that there are some good, like Voice Bunny, I think is a really good option. And I'm not, I guess I shouldn't diss that and say that it's not quality, uh, but, but we, you know, because we were focusing in and we just wanted to do it right and have it highly polished, we felt it was better to do ourselves. Um, okay. And so far it's, it's worked out. <laughs> um, did you try to, to, to I mean, because uh, I, I saw myself in the same metaphoral problem that you m mentioned that people don't know how to, uh, because they are expecting to be a game, I it to be a game. Yes. Um, did you try to, to use metaphors like audiobook or li like audible? I mean, you just started and then you missed the go back 30 seconds in iTunes. Um, well, we do have controls that you can you can go backward and re replay a, f a file. Is that what? No, I, I, me I meant, did you try to place it like an audiobook? Oh, instead oh. Of an Okay, I know what you're saying. Yeah, in terms, yeah. you're talking about in terms of categories yeah. and 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 surfacing. Uh, that has been really difficult. You know, it's it's like, is it a book? Like the first time we came out, we were like, okay, you know, we'll we'll call it a book. Well, we we had games and book and like role playing game and adventure game and th you know some people would be like, this isn't a game. You know, in a comment, and we mostly get very positive uh, reviews. But some people w will be like, well, this isn't a game. And then others like we we switched and we made an entertainment app and it, and it kind of did a little bit better we thought with that. But at the same time, when then we got a feature. Uh, in UK and like I think about 50 other countries, and um, you know it, it was like the only entertainment labeled app that was up among the games, and we d we didn't know why that happened or what, but um, so we thought well maybe we should switch back to games, and we're in a dilemma of that right now. What are we? It's it's a kind of an identity crisis, and we're trying to you know uh, to figure that out as we go. More questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We have time. <laughs> um, which speech recognition solution did you end up using? Oh, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's called uh, Polite Tix Open Ears. Sorry. Uh, Polite Tix Open Ears. Oh, okay. It's 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 iOS only, uh, open source, and we uh, we've gone with that, and that's that's for iOS. We had to come up with something completely different for Android, and I think we're working with Pocket Sphinx and doing some other stuff. Oh, okay. So, and that, uh, that is one of those issues. It's, it's hard to find a universal solution with this kind of a thing. I, I'm sure it'll happen at some point. It's just not quite there yet. Any other questions? No? Then let's say thank you to our amazing speakers. Thank you.